Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which you may also know as ADHD, is a disorder that crops up somewhere in childhood and is something that the person will have for the rest of their life. And as the name kind of tells us here, ADHD is a disorder where the person struggles with their ability to pay attention. And they can also be hyperactive and actually a bit impulsive too. And at the moment, we aren't entirely sure yet why ADHD happens, what causes it. But we do know a few things. We've collected a few clues along the way that are helping paint a picture about what might be going on. So we know that if a family member, someone who shares some of our DNA, if a family member has ADHD, like maybe a parent, well, then their child is actually more likely to also develop ADHD. And if both parents have ADHD, then their child is even more likely to develop ADHD as well. And we also know that boys are more likely than girls to develop ADHD. So both of these here, these clues, suggest that genetics plays some sort of role in the development of ADHD. But we're just not quite sure yet what that role is. And we've also found out that there are a few environmental factors, like exposure to tobacco, that can increase a kid's chance of developing ADHD. And while we're on the topic of environmental factors, I should mention here that there are a few that we sometimes hear about, like eating too much sugar or watching too much TV, that actually are not causes of ADHD. These are common misconceptions. So what might be going on in the brain of someone with ADHD? Well, we've actually got a clue about that too. And we got that clue from looking at the medications that we use to treat ADHD. And we'll look more at these medications in a little bit, but basically when we give kids with ADHD medications that increase the levels of certain chemicals called neurotransmitters, so specifically the neurotransmitters dopamine and norepinephrine, when we give people with ADHD these medications, these actually help them focus and pay attention and can help reduce their hyperactivity and impulsivity. So we think that in the brain of someone with ADHD, there's something going on with these dopamine and norepinephrine neurotransmitter systems, which is why the medications seem to be helping. But we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Now, having trouble with attention and being hyperactive and impulsive, well, these are things that we can all struggle with from time to time, right? So you might be thinking, well, when do these struggles become disordered? At what point are they considered ADHD and not just a normal variant? Well, in order for us to figure that out and to see what ADHD looks like, let's actually look at the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. So if we were to take a look inside one of our main diagnostic manuals here, which we call the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM, if we were to open this up and look up ADHD, this is what we would find. So there are two main symptoms that we would see here under ADHD. Oh, and I should, I should pop a 5 down here beside DSM, because we're currently on the 5th edition. So what we're looking at here is what we would see if we cracked open the current 5th edition of the DSM. Okay, so the first symptom here is inattention, so being really distracted and not really paying attention. And the second one here is hyperactivity and impulsivity. Now to help us figure out if someone's inattention or hyperactivity and impulsivity is disordered and not just the kind of struggles that everyone can have once in a while, the DSM gives us some examples of how these symptoms can manifest. And it's these that we use to see if someone has ADHD. So just to be totally clear here, there's no single test that you can do to diagnose ADHD in a child. Instead, there's kind of just a lot of discussion between parents and the clinician to see if these behavioral signs we just talked about are present in their child and how long they've been there for. So if we check out inattention first, let's look at some of the ways that this could manifest in someone with ADHD. So we would see things like the person making careless mistakes in their schoolwork or maybe at work. They would likely have trouble staying focused on a task like homework or maybe a game like Monopoly. They might not really listen when they're being talked to or they might have trouble following instructions, which could happen maybe if they hadn't been able to pay attention to the instructions in the first place or maybe because they're having trouble focusing on the task itself. 
They might have trouble finishing a task like homework or maybe chores, and they'll likely be easily sidetracked and often lose things that they need, like their keys or their wallet, really important things. So these examples, these manifestations of inattention that we would see in someone with ADHD, they kind of make sense, right? These are the kinds of things that would happen if you're having trouble paying attention. But the big thing with ADHD is that this inattention, it's constant and it interferes with daily life. It's not just once in a while. So if we move on to hyperactivity and impulsivity, how might these manifest? Well, we might see that the person is constantly fidgeting. Maybe they're squirming around or tapping their fingers. Things like this that show that they're being a bit more active than normal. They might get up and leave their seat a lot when they're supposed to stay seated, maybe during quiet reading time when they're at school. They'll likely run around and climb on things when it's not really appropriate to do this. And for adults, this hyperactivity and impulsivity might instead just be a feeling of restlessness rather than actually manifesting as a behavior like running around that we would see in a kid instead. We might see excessive talking or interrupting people when they're talking and blurting out answers to questions rather than waiting their turn. So all of these examples, if they were occurring constantly, they would point to the hyperactivity and impulsivity that we would see in someone with ADHD. And you might have picked up on the fact that I've been using this word a lot, constantly. And that's because there are a lot of other disorders and conditions that can actually look like ADHD because the child or adult would have these same sort of symptoms. But what sets ADHD apart from many of these other similar disorders and conditions is that for someone with ADHD, these symptoms are persistent. They occur across all settings like home and school, hanging out with friends, and they really interfere with the person's day-to-day -day life. Now I should also point out here that someone with ADHD, they may just have trouble with attention, or they may only have trouble with hyperactivity and impulsivity, or they might have trouble with both attention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. So these are the three sort of variations that we can see with ADHD. So for someone with ADHD, once they've been diagnosed, there are a few things that we can do to help treat these symptoms. So the two main things that we would usually do to treat ADHD are we would use medications and we would use behavioral therapy. So let's take a look at both of these. So with medications, there are two main types that we use to treat ADHD. And we can actually break these two types down into stimulants, and non-stimulants. Now you might be thinking, why would you give someone with ADHD a stimulant? I mean, that sounds like the last thing that you would need, right? Well, it turns out that these stimulants actually increase the levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, those neurotransmitters in the brain that seem to be lacking in someone with ADHD. So these stimulant medications are what we usually turn to first when treating someone with ADHD. And that's because these stimulant medications actually start working pretty quickly. And they also have a really long track record of being safe and effective for people with ADHD. But sometimes stimulants can have unwanted side effects. Or maybe the person has another disorder or condition that these stimulants kind of interfere with. So if stimulants aren't an option, maybe for one of these reasons, then we might turn to non-stimulants as a medication to treat ADHD. And when we say non-stimulants, we're talking about a really general group of medications. Basically, we're talking about any medication that we use to treat ADHD that isn't a stimulant. So for example, certain antidepressants can be really helpful for treating ADHD and are classified under this non-stimulant category. Now, if we move on to behavioral therapy, the goal there is to create an environment that allows someone with ADHD to function their best. So this might mean making sure that things are really organized. So making sure that keys and wallets are always put in the same place so that the person with ADHD doesn't really have to worry about getting distracted or forgetting where they put them. This could mean reducing distractions to make it easier for the person to focus on a task. So maybe something like not having TV on in the background when the child is doing homework. Reducing choices can help too. So maybe only giving the child two different options for what they want to wear to school rather than an entire closet where they might get sort of distracted. So these are just a handful of examples of what behavioral therapy might look like for someone with ADHD. 
And it's actually not uncommon for people with ADHD to also have other disorders or conditions on top of their ADHD that might need to be treated as well. So things like depression and learning disabilities and something called oppositional defiant disorder, which is when a kid is really disobedient towards authority figures. These are some examples of some conditions that are a bit more common in kids with ADHD compared to kids without ADHD.